Yes. My name is Atif Mirza, and I am a symposium volunteer, as well as the panel captain for this session, Transform Your Business Through IT. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Stephanie Warner, who is a research scientist at the MIT Center for Information Systems Research. And Stephanie will introduce our panelists. Thank you. Hi. Thank you all for coming here. And I wanted to give you a quick, um, uh, we call the Center for Information Systems Research Scissor. So if you hear me talking about scissors, that's what I mean. Uh, I've been a research scientist at MIT Scissor for um, nine years now. I've been at MIT since 2000. And my time at Scissor, I do research on digitization and uh, research on ecosystems, uh, reuse, uh, digital leadership, and as part of our overall stream of research at MIT Scissor on helping companies thrive in a digital economy. One of the reasons I'm very excited about uh, this panel is that Peter Weil and I did a uh, research project last year on how do uh, companies use Internet of Things to enable business model change. And Barb Wixom, who was in the panel here at the last session, uh, she and I are doing some work now on IoT, really expanding that out. But on this panel here, I thought that what we would talk about is how do companies use IoT to get new streams of revenue, to have a business model change. And with that, I'd like the uh, panelists to introduce themselves and really talk a little bit about what they're doing, especially in this area of business model change and IoT. Sure. Hey everybody, uh, Ryan Mallory. Uh, I'm with a, a, a data center interconnection facilities company called Equinix. Uh, got global responsibility for focusing on the pre-sales uh, solution architecture design, as well as the solution enablement through professional services. And so, you know, we're, we're really focused on developing and building um, capabilities for customers to bridge their data center, their network, their cloud and IT infrastructure for the next generation type of strategic initiatives that they're working on. IoT is an area that we're highly focused on right now based on the customer density and the, the network and service provider densities that we have inside the facilities. Um, really looking forward to a great discussion with the other panelists. Great, thank you, Ryan. This is so Paddy. I'm, I'm Paddy Srinivasan. Uh, I work at a company called LogMain, which is a public company based here in Boston. And I run the uh, IoT business for LogMeIn, which is called Zively. And Zively is a software platform, much like uh, what you guys provide as infrastructure. We provide the software side of it um, to take the technology, security, and infrastructure management out of the hands of the, the manufacturers so that they can focus on what Stephanie was talking about, which is to introduce new business models and disrupt themselves and, and uh, make new streams of revenue. So by doing this, it gives us uh, a ringside view into something profound that is happening today, which is companies reinventing themselves. Uh, companies that are trying to introduce new business models as a way to make uh, new revenue, uh, optimize service delivery, and so forth. So it's a fascinating place to be to see how companies are reinventing themselves and, and introducing new business models. Great. Mark? Hi, my name is Mark Bernardo, and uh, I'm responsible for the America's professional services team for a new organization in GE called GE Digital. It was formed uh, late last year. Uh, it was really the merger, uh, literally the merger of IT and OT together. So we took all of our IT uh, employees, and we took all of our software developers throughout the organization, and we brought them together under one organization called GE Digital. And this organization is really about you know, being the center point to helping GE become a digital industrial business. So when we think about a business model change, the, the uh, formation of this organization itself is probably the first piece of evidence that uh, GE is really all in in uh, trying to figure out how to capitalize on the value and the benefit of what we would call industrial IoT. Um, so we've got about 30,000 employees in this group worldwide. Wow. Uh, about 14,000 developers, and uh, you know, really, when I think about my daily life, running the services organization, it's it's how do we take all this disparate technology, and really make sure that the outcomes come alive um, with oftentimes disparate tech and disparate data sources, um, you know, for our customers. So that's that's my story. I like it. Indeed. 
My name is Dieter Haber and I'm the CEO for Daimler Trucks North America out of Portland. But I also said mainly I'm on an airplane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we, uh, you may know Daimler Trucks for so Freightliner, Western Star, Thomas Build Bar. So if you have an RV, mainly the chassis is from us because we have uh, almost 100% of the market there. Uh, we also have, you know, Daimler for Mercedes-Benz, so hopefully you drive one. And so we have plans all over, we work together, and we do a lot already in IoT. Um, in our manufacturing plants, with logistics, uh, supply chain, but not at all in the, in the manufacturing plants, but we also, our own truck is the internal thing because we have telematics on our trucks. So this is uh, kind of uh, interesting and involving and getting more and more interesting because we focus on connectivity as the big uh, next thing. Great. So some of the research that Peter and I have done uh, looked at what were the uh, things that were necessary for uh, business model change. And so I thought that I would ask the panelists to really expound on some of those uh, capabilities that we saw uh, companies building. So, Ryan, would you like to start on what are the, some of the most important IoT capabilities? What is it that you think is necessary? And uh, and then the other panelists can start. To sure. Answer. So, so we've got a pretty unique perspective where, for for um, you know much of you know Equinix's history, we've looked at it from a service provider and a capability standpoint. So, how are the service providers going to take um, IoT capabilities out to the marketplace? What we're starting to see right now is a fundamental change where the consumer side is becoming just as important because having the access to the, the hosted and the nested capabilities that IoT is driving is, is enabling the broader marketplace um, for the consumer base. And so what you're starting to see is not only just linear deployments of service models, but you're starting to see a branch type deployment model where you know customers are able to utilize services, uh, like Patty said, to optimize your, your digital uh, logistics stream through single service type of endpoints. And so we've really focused on enabling those capabilities, but instead of having a one-to-one -one type of deployment model, you're now able to utilize services that are out there with regional distribution and the software capabilities that we're seeing out in the marketplace to really accelerate your time to market and lower your barrier of entry. Patty. Cool, so there, there are several elements of um uh, of business model change. Um, based on our experience, I'll give you a very specific example which I think will be really interesting. So we sell to product manufacturers, so companies that make physical things. And if you look at the last 100 years or so that these many of these companies have been in business, um, they have seldom had any information about who's actually buying and using their products, mm -hmm. right? So with um, IoT comes a very unique ability to actually know who that person is and then have secondary and tertiary information about how they're using it, when are they using it, and things like that. But just knowing who is buying your products is, is a profound uh, um, uh, cap enhancement for you to change and, and create new business models because, um, let's be honest, who fills out the warranty forms, right? When you buy something <laughs> off, uh, off the shelf, uh, the, the manufacturers typically have no idea who is actually buying it, but with now, uh, apps and, and the ability to track who is buying it uh, gives you a new window uh, of opportunities that were never possible. So I believe knowing who the end user is of uh, physical products uh, is, is a very foundational aspect of uh, driving business model change in IoT. Yeah, that I couldn't agree with anymore. And you know, the unique aspect that we have as being part of GE is, uh, you know, we deal directly with end users from a GE digital perspective, but mm -hmm. we also sell a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, we've got 30,000 right, engines out there, we've got 20, 21,000 locomotives, and these are businesses within GE that GE Digital supply to. Right? We have about 450 manufacturing plants across the globe. These are the same manufacturing plants that we were being asked to come in and figure out ways to capitalize on the opportunity of IoT and enable new productivity. Mm -hmm. So the first piece is, you know, some of the customers, we know the customers, we know them really well, right, because they're us. Um, but the characteristics of, of, you know, our behaviors, in some cases marry to the end users, in some cases don't. So, you know, having the recognition that you need to capture who the end user is 
but also the roles they play and what personas they have to make sure that whatever outcomes we're delivering are optimized to that, I think is a really key element that we had to, to learn. And then for our transformation, you know, the, the, probably the two big characteristics we had to go through. One is we had to figure out if we were going to build or buy a platform to help weave all of this together. Our choice was to build, and that was, that's Predix, um, a, you know, a, a new cloud-based development platform that we've built. And the other thing that I would just say is, is really the cultural aspect. Um, in order to kind of go through a business model um, transformation, you, you need to recognize that you have a problem to begin with. And for us, there were two characteristics. One is we weren't agile enough, so we mm -hmm. had to be more agile. And the other one is that uh, we needed to show some humility, and that was the fact that we don't know everything. And you know, we really started in earnest an effort to find some of the best partners in the world that we could work with to make sure that we could ultimately um, make sense of, out of IoT and make sure that we're delivering the outcomes that our customers need. So how important were partners? Uh, it, 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 there, so if you think about, for example, if you think about that platform, so this, mm -hmm. we're, we are in the process of building and using an industrial cloud-based platform. Without partners, that goes nowhere. Um, you know, we need them to help us develop. We need them to help out, figure out an edge strategy because you know, that may or may not be our thing. We have all these different sensors that are out there. Um, that may or may not be our thing. So the importance of partners for our business model transformation is you know, one of the top three priorities we have. Mm -hmm. Dieter, what do you see as the uh, important capabilities that uh, Daimler had to develop to uh, really be successful at Internet of Things? So we focused early enough on connectivity, or you can also say telematics, whatever this is as a, as, as a word. So we started early because we see that, uh, let's say, just selling a truck is not enough because we provided a telematics device to the truck. And maybe, I guess you're all driving, not a truck, but maybe a car, and you had a maybe engine light or your car tells you something funny. Who had this? Never had this? <laughs> okay. uh, so what do you do? So when you're somewhere in the middle uh, of nowhere and there's an engine light saying, hey, there's an issue, how can you get help? So this is how we started um, with uh, equipping all our trucks uh, with a telematic device. And so we collect all the information from the, from the truck. So all the sensors, everything that's on the, on the truck. Uh, and if there is an issue, we send this information up to our, let's say, our cloud. And uh, so we collect that and we provide immediate real-time feedback to the fleet or the driver saying, oh, you're fine or maybe you're a little overheated because you drive over the Rocky Mountains. And uh, once we tell them, oh, there's an issue, maybe you should drive to the next service station, or you go, okay to go. So this is immediate <coughs> feedback what to do. And this is always nice when you have a time pressure, you want to uh, drive to a customer, you have a load on, on your truck. And this is how we change it. And then it's not only like changing it, because it's also like, okay, um, we communicate with the fleet or the driver telling them, oh, um, the first analysis shows that this is maybe the issue on your truck. This is the next service station that can help you. And by the way, we have the parts in our store. Uh, we will serve a service bay for you and we, you should come and you will be ready when you go to the dealership, they know that you're coming and this is the issue. So we also connect all those dots uh, this is a totally different model that we uh, to provide, and we will have more things that are coming now. So we have a lot of stuff in our pipeline um, for applications and, and support for driver, for fleet. So we collect a lot of data. So the skills is a lot of data, data analyst skills, usability, because this is a driver and how you tell them what to do. So, and uh, machine learning, so because we also go into predictive analysis mm -hmm. uh, of the data we collect. And we combine this. So there's a lot of act action in, let's say, big data, because Internet of Things generates a lot of data. So, I'm going to just uh, have this be a jump ball here. How about the talent? Are you finding that to be uh, difficult uh, in hiring the right kind of talent that you need? What is the talent that you need? I would assume data analytics. Uh, anything else that we're missing? 
I think it, I think it depends on the location where you're trying to do the development. So we, we see um, network expertise, you know, cloud service expertise, also development capabilities that, that you need. Um, in certain markets, they're highly competitive um, from the standpoint that, you know, if you're looking at Silicon Valley, you're looking at certain hotbeds on the East Coast, you're looking at Amsterdam, <laughs> Sydney, Singapore. Those are the areas where a lot of this development is, is happening today from the network to cloud integration as well as the overall app capabilities. So for, for us, for, from an Equinix standpoint, those are the markets that we see that are highly competitive um, from the standpoint of trying to gain it, but also keep it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and from my perspective, I, I think you know, that certainly captures a lot of it. For us at a, at a more tactical level, right, we traditionally have been a Microsoft house, so finding talent that is uh, you know, more Java-based, Python-based, um, not so enterprise-centric, um, mm -hmm. I think that was a big deal for us. Um, you know, people who are more familiar with, with Agile type of uh, methodologies versus waterfall type of methodologies from a development practice perspective is another element. And then I think culturally, um, you know, was probably one of the, the biggest issues. In order to kind of figure out IoT, um, you need to, to have a, uh, a, a mentality that, um, that is, is very collaborative and very iterative. So, you know, when we think about the manufacturing plants, we have our IT communities and our OT communities, and they don't always talk the same language. And the skill sets that we need to bring in are people that can kind of do that level of translation to make sure that we're interpreting things correctly and apply those interpretations to deliver the right outcomes. Mm -hmm. So like how you, you mentioned Agile, uh, one of the interesting things we are observing is that like how DevOps was born from Agile. Yeah. Uh, a new role is emerging in the enterprise. Um, when you have a connected product, somebody has to monitor and manage and operate the product. Yeah. So we feel like that role is, is called product ops. Like DevOps is to development and Agile product ops is to a connected product. And that role is now being fulfilled by different people in different organizations, but that is a, a, a core talent gap where you need the right tools and mechanisms and processes to make sure that your connected product fleet is uh, working and is healthy and yeah. take some corrective action. Yeah, I mean, so we, that particular role we call service ops in our organization. <laughs> and probably one of the initial learnings, when we went through the business model transformation, we say it's absolutely necessary but when you originally looked at the business plan, there was, there was nothing in there from a, uh, a cost of ownership perspective, right? So DevOps is absolutely critical. The first customer you stand up that you're monitoring, that's going on forever if you keep that customer mm -hmm. forever. Yet the cost for the infrastructure and the people oftentimes weren't built into the business model. So it really requires a complete relook at the business model characteristics as you start to look at these new roles. This goes back, uh, Peter and I did some research uh, oh, probably six or seven years ago about reuse. And you probably have to think very carefully about how, who's going to pay for that first stand? How's it going to mm -hmm. get amortized over mm -hmm. time? Uh, what's it going to cost for the next person who's using that? That's so. exactly correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Heavy investment in automation right now um, on our side. Mm -hmm. Trying to capture all the best practices and automating as much as possible. Never perfect, you need to continue to rate, but you're absolutely right. Dieter, yeah, I'd like in, to... Yeah. In order to be fast, we also work with third parties because sometimes you need something super fast and yes. agile. There's no other way to do it. And then you see that this is part of your core skills. You have to do something also real fast and ramp up those skills. So this is uh, agile, how you do the DevOps, you say product ops. This is an um, important next step. And how you scale that. You can always do something in certain areas where it's important, but how you scale it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at, let's say, if you Google like uh, data scientists, like go back 2012, there was almost nothing that you can, because it wasn't there. So now it's a new skill set. And hopefully there are enough people out there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to start with you yeah. for this next question, because this is a CIO symposium. So, uh, and you are the CIO on this panel. <laughs> so what's the role of the CIO? How does the CIO um, help in uh, getting the organization to change? Uh, where does the CIO fit in? It's a very important role because we have a vision. We talk to our business partners. They know what they want, but sometimes we see technology that they don't know. So we push hard, we drive hard, we, we have joint teams. 
uh, where we really like the forefront of technology. We show them proof of concept what they can do. So we have a very important role in, um, let's, say, let's say, connectivity. It's half business, has, has half of is IT. Right. So we show them what's possible, then we have to deliver very fast in, let's say, agile mode. So our role is ever changing because we, we have to, let's say, provide innovations in order to make a business change. And then we have to prove it and show it. Mm -hmm. So we also come from, let's say, thinking a little about uh, disruptive. So kind of, if you don't think disruptive, so I've, what would I do in order to disrupt my own business? This is a good question yeah. to ask, how can you help the business? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, from, from my perspective in GE, um, the, the CI, CIO kind of owns the, key, the keys to the kingdom uh, now. And, and that's very different than where it was four or five years ago. Um, you know, it, especially in manufacturing plants, it mm -hmm. was the operational side, the plant managers, the operation directors that made most of the buying decisions, and that's no longer true. Um, it's, they obviously are they're solicited, but the, the CIO is making the decision. I think the, the challenge that we face again, from a business model perspective, and, and it's some errors that we made early on, is you can satisfy all of the requirements that the CIO tells you to satisfy. You deliver a project on time and on budget, and you may still not deliver the outcomes that the operational team needs. Right? So upfront alignment between the CIO and the operation side and making sure it's crystal clear to what you're delivering, what the goals are, is an imperative if you truly want to get to an outcome-based delivery model and be successful at it. Um, so. That's, that would be my perspective. So if, if I can spice up things a little bit, I think you guys are outliers. Um, <laughs> for the most part, the people that we work with, the CIO is not even in the conversation because A, they're too busy doing something internal and uh, the business people that are trying to build connected versions of their products want to keep the IT away so that they don't complicate things. They just want to start. And this reminds me of even eight years back when the, the move to SaaS and cloud became really popular. The shadow IT was popping up everywhere yeah. within the organization, and, and I see the same thing in IoT. Uh, the CIO, and if there are CIOs in the audience, this is a, a, a good place to start because you're being left out yeah. uh, of the conversation. So what's the role of that, uh, the yeah. characteristics that you just kind of talked through? What's the primary role of the buyer in that case? What, what role does that person have? They're typically uh, leaders in the, in the product organization. So they're developing products, though, yes. right? Mm -hmm. so, so maybe the distinction, it, and maybe we are complete outliers, but maybe the distinction, at least in my head, is when I think about a product development community, I think the, the role of the CIO does shift a bit. In, in my mind, when I'm thinking about a, a manufacturing facility, um, that is where I'm seeing the CIO be more prominent. So I don't know if, if that would change your perspective or if... We're Maybe this, this is why our company is more than 125 years old. <laughs> <laughs> About 138, 138 yeah, okay. years. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I'd have to agree or disagree with all three of you because I see, I see a completely different view of the CIO moving more from an IQ-focused person into an EQ-focused person. So somebody that's moved from just technology internal to the corporation to somebody who's out there funding strategic initiatives somebody who's helping to develop new technology for interconnection, especially around IoT-based services, but also helping drive strategy out in the broader marketplace. So it's not just about being the smart guy who's able to procure laptops the quickest, but it's also understanding the platforms that are out there. So I've got a very different view, and what we're seeing, especially out in Silicon Valley, is this trend is... It's, it's younger, it's more adaptive, it's more focused right now, and there are CIOs that want to stay focused simply on the, you know, the traditional um, IT type capabilities, but if you're not making that traditional, or if you're not making that switch from the traditional model into a more EQ based where you know, you're that strategic leader inside the business, I think that you're, you're going to um, you know, become a little bit obsolete. So can I ask you a question on that? In the, in the EQ definition, would you include kind of the the skill set of change leadership is part of that role? Absolutely. Right? So Absolutely. In, in that particular case, when I think about our role, the transformation of the CIO, mm -hmm. they, they evolved to the primary buyer, mm -hmm. okay? And the great CIOs in our business, and that's the overwhelming majority of them now, mm -hmm. um, what they've done 
is, is they're developing that business partnership. Yep. They're providing the strategic fit vision and they're leading the organization through change, yep. not just technology, Absolutely. but organizational behavioral change, which is real key. I, I completely agree. And, and that's where the, this functional change to be a true strategy leader versus just somebody who's focused internal is, is where we're seeing CIOs become much more important to the overall dynamics inside yeah. a business model, but also having a far greater impact. Yeah. Absolutely. Our research is showing that too, is that uh, the amount of time that CIOs are spending, that, that really good CIOs and top performing firms are spending on services is really decreasing the mm -hmm. time that they're spending with uh, their business partners, out with customers, or on enterprise processes is increasing. Mm -hmm. So you brought up um, organizational change. What is IoT doing for organizational change or what kinds of organizational, let's flip it, what, does, or what kind of organ, organizational change does the firm need to go through to actually successfully use IoT? There's got to be you know, any number, I mean, uh, from talent to uh, you know, training to new skills, what do we have? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Now, what are we going to do yeah, here? Yeah, all, all the above. So, you know, let, let's start looking at business models, and, and we we take I take a very different approach than you know the, than the other panelists because we're a service provider. Um, you know, they provide services inside their business units and and outward to an extent. I'm looking at it more of a macro level from the service provider perspective. So, w when you start looking at what are the change management capabilities that you need to build into this process, you know, you, your your workforce has to be significantly dynamic. They're, they're, it's not just coming in and being able to focus on a single base technology. You know, we're talking about agile development cycles, so, so the time to market for products is compressing. The need for dynamic product launches is increasing, and your ability to be able to answer your customer needs and your capability, um, it just, you just have to stay dynamic and focused on what's happening out in the marketplace. I, I totally agree. I think along with agility also comes um, a new um, way of uh, looking at the organization. So the customer service aspect becomes really mm -hmm. important as your things get connected. And we've had numerous examples. So things we take for granted as a software company, uh, because we are not 138 years old, we are fairly new, we were born on the cloud. So we certain things that we take for granted, like knowing your customer and servicing them and communicating with them, proactively and, and being really agile comes first nature to a company which is fairly young. Uh, but we see a lot of product manufacturing companies asking us to come over to our offices to actually mm -hmm. observe. 60, 70, 80 year old companies come to us and say, hey, can we spend half a day with your customer services team so that we can learn the best practices in terms of social communication and connecting with, your, uh, with our end cu customers. So those are elements of the organizational change, I believe, are really important as companies try to change their business model from just being product-based to product and services-based. Yes, spot on. Um, you know, when I think about when I think about GE, a few different things. One is, you know, what what Jeff Immelt asked every single vertical business, and we have some pretty big P&Ls. Um, his first message is bend yourself to be horizontal. Right? Forget about the vertical premise for a minute. Because the only way we're going to scale is to find a way to lean on each other's strengths and contribute to what he would call the GE store. So as you build things, contribute them, we'll open them up, people will collaborate, it'll get better. So that was kind of the first thing. The second thing when I think about the product management function, we had to really retool that function because features and functions don't win the day anymore. Right? Technology in and of itself is becoming a commodity. The products we used to sell are being commoditized. So how do you, you know, not let that happen? you deliver value-added services on the back of it. So we had to really create a whole new suite of offerings from advisory services to adoption services to consultative services to make sure that the customers are really getting value. Our whole managed service um, operation as well, which is we'll actually monitor the customer assets to find learnings ahead of time and predict failures ahead of time is a whole new service business model stream that just didn't exist years ago and it was really forced by this transition. Mm -hmm. See, I, I struggle a little bit with organization because organization is always like dotted line, sorted line. So I, this I'm, I'm an organizational yeah, theorist. It's changed Sorry. all the time. <laughs> for, for me, it's, a, it's really leadership. At the end, when we have to solve a, a, a problem, we work as a team. No matter if you have IT in front of you or business or whatever or infrastructure, 
we don't care or I don't care. So it's really like training my, my, my team, let's say from a leadership, we, who do we need in order to solve our problem? How, what, what kind of skills do I need? Some of these uh, people that are what I call the Einsteins that are really disruptive, uh, chaos, or the Edisons that just do it and make it happen. And then uh, you have to be agile and fast and come together in, in a kind of like a, in, in one room and work on that for a limited time, but then you move on to something else. We have another, let's say, a colleague that um, worked on uh, Disruptive, but they formed the company, like almost like your approach. They formed the company and said, oh, this is now a new company, stand alone in the market. So this is the next step for, let's say, organization change, to be very fast, close to the customer, and, and really competitive. So you may have had that figured out all along. I mean, I think, when I think about our business, one of the big transformations we have to go through organizationally is, you know, we're 300,000, people. We're a fairly hierarchical organization, and the DNA of GE has always been a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's shifted, mm -hmm. right? Shifted because you need to be much more collaborative and flatter in order to win the day in this new dynamic environment. But if you look at the talent that's bringing in, right, the, the, especially the millennials, they, they think differently. They, mm. they feed mm. off of energy differently. They mm. want their voice to be heard. Right? They don't respond to the same type of hierarchical structure. So, yep. so it really created a, um, an interesting dynamic in our business as we went through the, the change. We had to do a lot of change leadership within our business in order to get there. I, and, I agree. Right. Yeah, yeah so I, I, think, I think the yeah. walled garden mentality that we've seen in standard brick and mortar and legacy companies has definitely started to come down, especially around IoT and next-gen service development. Um, we, we partner with everybody on the panel here to help look at, develop, and find better ways to operate capabilities out in the marketplace. I'm not sure that that would happen five or 10 years ago yeah. if some of these market initiatives and changes wouldn't have started to happen. So um, we see a lot more cross-functional internally, but also cross-functional externally collaboration taking place. Do you see yourself being more as an ecosystem? Do you have to be more open? Are you making some of your crown jewels uh, available? How are you doing that? That's our business model. So, so we operate ecosystems, um, but with that, we've always had, I would say, about a knee-high walled garden around, trying to make sure that we could protect the, the, the crown jewel assets you know, with, with specific moats. What we've had to look at is, is it okay to enable some of our competitors? Is it okay to enable people that um, maybe eventually taking business from us to come in so we can understand ecosystem dynamics, how they're going to develop, but more importantly, market trends out there that typically we said, hey, we're not concerned about, you know, what we're, we're able to execute and operate. We've, we've taken some drastic approaches in just the last two, two and a half years around letting some competitors, like I said, and, and technology enablement um, capabilities into our facilities, into our ecosystems, the network, the data center, the cloud IT and financial that, you know, we wouldn't have done in the past. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think ecosystem is is the only way to go. I don't see any other option, especially in the world of IoT, both um, in the connected home as well as in the industrial side. Uh, and look at connected home. I don't think you're going to see another Windows or an Apple ecosystem in the home. It's going to be very democratized. There are going to be multiple different things that your product has to work with, whether it is Nest or Echo or what have mm -hmm. you. So, if you're not uh, a first-class player in an ecosystem, then it's game over. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, think, I, I think in that model, though, one of two things need to happen, right? Either there has to be someone who has a very established, agreed-upon point of view. So as you're developing these disparate assets, you can, they can all talk the same language. The descriptions and the definitions of the assets and the properties and the signals we're pulling off all the, are, are all the same or you need to kind of drive it through a standards consortium of some sort. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I do agree. I think you know, one of the errors a lot of businesses made in the past is they thought um, they didn't have to be agnostic. They can just solve for everything themselves. And that clearly is not the case. But what we started a trip on is a bunch of people started developing a lot of different things. And if you're trying to make it all work together in the manufacturing environment, unless you have some way to normalize <laughs> the inputs, it's really difficult to maximize the outputs. Mm -hmm. So. I think that's the trick, right? It, either a bunch of people need to work together on a standard, or someone is going to say, this is the point of view, this is the best way to think about this, then we can have 15,000 people develop around it, and it's all going to work together. And how are you doing it, Dieter? Yeah, we share the data we collect with our fleets, 
-hmm. They get all the data we have because they want to draw their own conclusion, make their own decisions. And on top of that, we also look at, let's say, third-party apps. How can, we, how can they help us with what we do in connect connectivity? There are so many innov innovative ideas out there that I cannot have, let's say, alone. So we have to tap into the, their knowledge. And so we also have to provide a platform for them to be on top of our data. Mm -hmm. So that so itself important. is an opportunity for business model change. Yes. The way you broker data mm -hmm. yeah. and, mm -hmm. and connect with your mm -hmm. ecosystem. Yep. Correct. So I'm going to um, ask people to co start coming to the mics if they have any questions while you're doing that. I thought I'd um, ask the panelists to each talk about one of your big successes so far. Do you have any? Oh. <laughs> I mean, the big success, let's say this way, is always when you do something great, what you think it's great. And uh, so we provided a solution for our, let's say, plant with uh, providing them real-time information about the plant works on an app, on an iPhone or iPad. The plant manager can see in real time how the plant works. And so he's, he's showing it around to other plant managers. And when you get phone calls from all the other plant managers, the next day they want to have it too, that's success. Uh -huh. And it happens. So you have to be fast, develop something really fast, it's usable, uh, and they want to have it. So that's for me innovation. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, you know, um, one of my examples would also be in the manufacturing space. So, you know, again, we have all these manufacturing sites. They have heavy investments today. And quite frankly, most of the operators are happy with the way it works, right? They've been using it forever and they don't want it to change. So the first hurdle we need to get, get over was how do we create something that's compelling enough and that's going to create a proof point that's impactful enough mm -hmm. to shift the opinion. And, you know, we went in from a manufacturing perspective and instrumented um, a particular cell in, in one of our turbine plants it was just one cell in one team, and uh, sensor enabled all of it, had all of the different data points aggregated together, and had new views that were very specific to the role that the, the operator had. Mm -hmm. So their insights were much more deterministic. They didn't have to look at a screen and figure out what to do next. What to do next was staring them at the face. Mm -hmm. And within three months, uh, the productivity at that plant, three months, 25% improvement, mm -hmm. right, as wow. an example. That's fantastic. Yes. Mm -hmm. So to me, success is all about um, uh, making what was only available for the, the privileged, like the, the GEs of the world, and actually democratizing that um, for companies that are making even $50 worth of products, right? So telematics that was only a, uh, affordable uh, if you had a $25,000 uh, device. It's now possible if, you're just, if, if your bomb is even 20 bucks. You can actually put technology in there, start tracking it. So I think that, at a, at a macro level, I think that is a big success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we worked very closely with uh, an industrial uh, equip equipment maker that was building very large mining equipment. And so they came to us and they said, you know, we've got these very remote mines, the gold mines um, out in you know, the Australian outback. For us to put in um, an actual person out there cost us more than a million dollars a year to have that physical person out there, the medical staff, the cantina, the transportation back and forth to civilization. So they said, we need to know and understand how we can put um, you know, remote control, basically, you know, telematic services on these vehicles. I mean, you're talking you know, 30, 40 foot high trucks that are carrying you know, multiple tons of, of uh, gold ore at a time out there so you, you don't have to have people. So we started looking at this, building edge aggregation capabilities. So in essence, it's just like an individual driving a drone. They're driving this, these massive pieces of mining equipment, allowing you to therefore lower your operational costs from, from a headcount perspective, raising your actual output in the mining facilities because you're able to work, in essence, 24 hours a day by having somebody in, a, in another location man the actual mining equipment itself. So um, that was very successful for us. We used a lot of WAN acceleration, mobile wireless, tying that back into citralized interconnection facilities and cloud-based analytics to, to allow this provider of you know, industrial mining equipment to be very successful and lower their, their capabilities and their capability costs. Perfect. I think we have a question here. Thank you very much, Great panel. Uh, my question is about using more of the data, of the IoT data that is being collected. I mean, there have been statistics that maybe 90, 95% of IoT data is either unused or underutilized. 
Um, I could frame the question as, uh, what are the issues and problems that hold you back? But I'm more interested in, what are the opportunities ahead for getting more use out of the IoT data that you're collecting, that you're able to do now? And how uh, will you get there in terms of technology, organization, um, et cetera? I think it's understanding what type of information you're trying to trend. And so I would agree that a lot of the, the edge-based or extended edge-based edge data that's collected does go into some type of micro storage at the edge. So if you're looking at the vast number of endpoint sensors that are out there, that information may just be a simple link state. Hey, is this light on in a building? You know, that doesn't have any relevance, but it may be important once that light bulb burns out or once a specific piece of equipment is used or somebody consumes something. So a lot of what we're gathering right now is can be you know viewed as noise out there, but we, we just don't have enough time in a lot of the analytical capabilities to understand what's relevant and how to act on it. So I think over time, as we start to bin, build trending models around on what's important and how we can digest that information, you'll see a lot more of it start to be consumed. Yeah, from my, from my perspective, it's, it's really about two things. One is it's enabled the, enabling the connections to take place themselves. Like there's a lot of these disparate data sources that are just out there that co collect locally mm -hmm. and have no way to bring that data up in a way where you have context and then can kind of do fleet level analysis on it. So one of the things we've been working on heavily is how do we enable those providers just to connect their data up? very simply, and then we can work with them to try to make sense out of this. And that would be the, the first thing, getting connected. And then the second thing is, um, this is truly where the value of big data can come into play. And if I think about our use case, think about what one jet engine on a flight from New York City to Chicago. One engine has about just under 1,000 sensors and generates a terabyte of data in that one flight. Okay? So multiply that by X number of flights over a year, a little bit of data. Um, and the only way to kind of make sense of it is to bring it up in an area you can process it and then apply the right data science experts to pick up on anomalies you wouldn't otherwise see. So I think that's the other piece of it, which is just understanding that there, there's probably learnings there if you apply the right processing power and the right domain expert. The learning center is going to jump off the, the page, but if you, can, if you think the problem is big enough and you apply the right expert, you can make sense. Mm -hmm. I would say you're completely right. So we have lots of databases where we collect data. And now with the big data technology, we just tap in those databases and combine it. And then we ask new questions like, oh, how about this? Oh, we didn't collect the data. Or maybe how about collecting this data on top of that? And then suddenly you combine some things that, wow, this is an interesting, let's say, outcome of that data. So once you combine, let's say, our data from the truck with warranty data, you have interesting results and you can draw conclusions. And in the end, we also, let's say, talk to the business. What kind of answers, what kind of questions do you have that we can answer for you? And then you see also like, oops, we should maybe collect that information as well. And uh, sometimes you also have to have a history of data. So this is a very good question. But the technology is out there. <laughs> uh, and so we do a lot with big data in the cloud so we can do all these analytics. Next question. Tomek Kostrovic from uh, Hologic uh, iPadding. Um, question for you um, around compliance, right? You guys all deal with industries that happen to be heavily deregulated in some areas, and they are regulated differently in different regions. If you deal with Department of Defense, you have a whole different layer of regulation, compliance, and then so forth. How do you deal with this? Um, do you find that it slows you down and uh, you know, uh, personally identifiable information and, and sensitive information, that, that type of stuff? It, it certainly slows you down. <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with it? Yeah, so, so we keep our legal team busy. That would be the first thing. Um, you know, as we come out with new products, we try to be l relatively specific so we can still go fast, right? So if we have a particular offering that we want to launch, we, we pick a region where we know what the compliance issues are going to be and we have control mechanisms in place to deal with that, first and foremost. That way they can prove out the value, iterate on it, and then, you know, work with, um, with, with regions that might have more restrictive type of rules. Um, in some cases, it's just a matter of hosting the data in country. So one of the things that we're doing is we're putting up you know, foundries and data centers to serve 
the globe, right? We, we, our, our original data center was, was just you know, North America bound, and that is no longer true. So that helps with some of the compliance issues. Some of the compliance issues are, you know, can we de-anonymize the data or anonymize the data, depending on what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, we're able to strip it away, and that removes the compliance capability. And, and sometimes it's just picking and choosing, you know, what data is going to be most important. You know, we have customers who say, hey, here's all the data I want to send up, and some of it is restricted. So our answer is we can spend our time trying to problem solve that, but our hypothesis is there's enough data in this information that isn't restricted, let's figure that out first, right? Because that way there we can start to churn some real value while we continue to work some of the heavy lifting. To add what you're saying is, uh, yes, we also have agreements with our dealers, our customers and fleets, so we know what they, they know what we do with the data. I'm probably unique on the, on the panel. It drives opportunity for us because you know, having distributed facilities around the globe, um, you know, 41 metros, 20 countries, when you start to get compliance, you have to localize data. You know, so, so we have interconnection access points in all those types of markets, wherever there's um, fiber interconnection, data interconnection points. So it, it's, it's an upside opportunity for us because we want to help our partners um, be able to store what's important for them, but also meet the legal requirements for um, you know, how you can pass employee information and what you have to store where. Got anything to add? No, I think I think okay. we'll go to the next question. Covered everything. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Nirmal. Um, I had a question around um, addressing the talent gap or the skills gap in this particular uh, discipline. So, people who can ask the right questions. Uh, so, we're collecting a lot of data, and whether you're a startup or whether you're GE, you're collecting a terabyte of data in one flight, in one small, short distance flight, and that's a lot of data to analyze. So, um, for a startup, are you going outside, and, and for GE, are you training these individuals from the inside? Is that a track they're available, or are you making available for employees who do want to uh, sort of, you know, turn this data into actionable insights and ask the right questions? So what's your sort of uh, uh, strategy on filling that talent gap within the organization? Well, that's a great question, and if I can start off. Uh, I think um, the, the biggest um, key point there is that as, uh, as data people or information technologists, we always think about, okay, let's just capture as much information as possible and then we'll figure out what to do with the data, like uh, one of your questions. Uh, but turning that on its head, uh, asking the questions around, okay, what am I trying to accomplish here? How am I going to make money? And what do I need, need to track? And then reverse engineer from that, then put that right type of instrumentation uh, is what I'm seeing successful hardware manufacturers do at this, uh, this point because it's really hard and then you, you start capturing things that you actually don't need and you start um, having this compliance type of uh, problems because maybe you're not, not even putting the data to use. So it's really important to ask what uh, applications you're trying to build or how you're planning to monetize that and then work backwards and, and figure out exactly what you're trying to capture. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's fair. And, and, and I think for us it's an and, not an or. So we have both available, right? We do have internal tracks to develop our talent accordingly. Mm -hmm. I think what we recognize, though, is there's just some capabilities. So let's think about data science. Yep. That's a really hard one to develop, right? So we tend to recruit for that particular access. We're developing out new advisory services for our services business. Um, we're typically going out and hiring consultants or business process analysts right, to help that. That's sort of hard to develop inside. But if you're talking about technical programming skills, if you've got someone that's sharp that knows how to problem solve and you know, is, is open to change, you absolutely right, can, can train them up. And what we're seeing is people are loving the opportunity. Right? The, the worst thing people hear mm -hmm. as we're going through this transformation is the product that I've been working on is dead. That's my identity. That's my DNA. What am I to do? And as soon as you can give them you know, another road to the promised land and show them the way they get all ignited again. And we've, got, we've got people that have been in industry for 35 years that kind of were winding down in the career, and now they're alongside you know, people that are 25 years their junior. They're given an avenue to Im improve their success. They're all over it, and they're being looked upon as gods by, the, by these you know, younger people. So it creates a whole new energetic dynamic that didn't exist. So a lot of companies will say, we have to replace the talent. Our philosophy is the talent you have typically is there for a reason. They got unbelievable domain expertise that you never want to lose. They can be the best mentors on the planet, and they can evolve. 
you want to partner them with the new right talent. And um, I was in this, uh, George Westerman had this panel about skills, and he said that all MIT uh, graduates go to startups, uh, and they don't like large companies. He says, oh, they should come to me, because we are a large company, you are a large company, and we have fun, because it's not like, what is wrong with a large company? Because we're ever-changing, there's always new opportunities. Uh, we have, uh, let's say, uh, ideas, we do it, mm -hmm. and also we are, let's say, more flexible than they maybe think, and we also have new areas like con uh, connectivity, telematics, the self-driving truck. Yeah, so we cool. you saw that a year ago. So those are fun topics, and I, I would let's say, urge all those MIT students to give me a call. <laughs> 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 yeah, I have to add, add to what they're saying. But we, had to, we had to change our, our hiring profile. So what we originally were looking for five years ago were people that were very se senior in network certification skills, right. PMP, the whole work. People that had 15, 20 plus years experience because we were, we were in the platform design and enabling stage of, of what we were trying to roll out. What we've done in the last two and a half to three years is say, wait a minute, we need to take into account the views of the millennials and the development skills that they want to develop and bring them in and say, you know, not only do we want really senior people who may be stuck in their ways, but we also want people that we can help grow, but also get their well-rounded opinion from the standpoint of, hey, this is what's important to me. Because what's important to the guys and gals that I've had on the team that are 20 plus years have a very, very different viewpoint than some of the, some of the newer people that we're bringing in. Yeah. It's, not, it's not right or wrong, it just makes for a much more cohesive team. Totally so do you, do you hire problem solvers and then uh, you know, throw them, I guess, essentially, you know, put them on a team and throw this set of data, whether it's one gig or 100 you know, terabytes or whatever it is, or do you find folks with specialized skills in data analytics and then you know, hope that they can figure out like, problems with your data? Yeah, quick question from my perspective. I think there are skills you just have to go find a data scientist, right? There's just those niche skills. The thing that I've always learned is if you have someone who can think broadly, who can communicate well, who can problem solve, and who can assimilate knowledge quickly, I'll take that person yeah. yep. 10 times a day, even if they have no technical training at all, because I guarantee you yeah. I can get them there. All right, right. thank you. Yep. Okay. I'm going to, we have a, probably another question. All right, Vince Wicker, MGI Research. Uh, one of the questions I'm finding uh, that a lot of people are asking me to ask my clients, and what I want to ask those of you who sell your services to outside, how do you rate or monetize or sell a subscription for the data you're providing from your IoT? Are you just saying that you have this much data per month, or are you finding a way to charge and monetize it in a way that it becomes not gouging, but value-added for both yourself and your customers? <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> so we do have some models that are purely just consumption-based, right? You want this much data? Do you pay X, right? In other models we have, um, and again, it really kind of varies by industry, it could be connection-based. We don't care how much data you consume, but we want to know if five people are consuming it versus 10. But I will tell you where the trend is going, and we do have bought models in place, and this one probably is going to be the most stickiest, but it's the most tricky to get through, is what if you don't charge for the data? What if you don't charge for the connections, but you only charge for a percentage of the outcome gained? So if we have someone who is running a gas turbine, and we can demonstrate that we can save them one failure per year, and that failure saved them $10 million, then you pay us a percentage of $10 million, right? It's an outcome-based model that has nothing to do with any of it, but man, it, it removes all of the risk from the buyer, and it places much more risk on, on the provider, but I think the trend is starting to go, th go that way. There, it isn't there in mass yet. We certainly aren't there in mass yet. But if I was to say, you know, it, one thing that is really getting sticky, it's how can you monetize the value of the outcome versus just the data itself? Because people don't want to look at it as a tax on their business. The more right. data I get, it's all of, all of a sudden a tax. Mm -hmm. So right. that's a question I have, like, and that's an excellent perspective yeah. on it. Thank you. So uh, I think I'm going to go with the uh, what Dieter calls the MIT question, which is, what is your two sentence advice to companies? Oh. It can be a little longer than two sentences. But uh, why don't we? So you, did I start? Yeah, so why uh, don't you start since you thought uh, of the question? 
And so how do you uh, disrupt your own business? This is the main question. If, if you know the answer, just do it before others do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. OK, yeah. <laughs> I, I, how do I top that? <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess my, I mean, we, I think we talked a lot about the, the tactical um, pieces. You know, you, you need mm -hmm. that level of humil humility. You need to be okay to make bets. I mean, from a GE perspective, there's no bigger bet that we could possibly make than to shed our capital business and yep. shed our appliance business and invest a boatload of money in this new business called GE Industrial. We are all in. So I think if you believe right, that there's something out there, don't be afraid to be bold. Um, but the other thing that I would just stress, because, again, for us, it is the difference between success and failure. Technology is super important. Partnerships are super important. The people that you have within your business and the people that are effectively your customers is where the difference can be made. Those relationships, whether or not you can deliver the outcomes and get their trust and their buy-in and their sponsorship, that's what's gonna end up transforming. If you can't get the adoption of your solution to take place so they can see the outcomes the way that you need to, you're going to fail. So, you know, that whole change leadership concept in parallel to all the other things we talked about today, I think is really key. So from my perspective, since this panel is all about business model change, I'll, uh, I'll say that uh, the biggest thing that is happening around us is, especially for physical products, um, the value is, is significantly shifting from the product itself to all of the other services and the add-on experiences that you can deliver. So um, if, if you are making decisions for your company, I, biggest advice I can give you is start shifting that. And as uh, Dater said, uh, disrupt yourself by not thinking about how much value you can get up front for your product, but think about how much money you can make over a period of time by changing that into a subscription model because a subscri subscription economy is here to stay. Yeah. So that would be my biggest advice. I'd have to say be willing to set the tempo with uh, solution enablement. So don't look at single source solutions anymore. Start looking at what the marketplace is willing to um, make available, what you can access, and what you can change in your, in your overall deployment models. Lower your um, time, to, time to entry into those markets, barrier to entry, and, and it'll help relieve any of your technical challenges that you have. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great panel, and uh, please join me in a round of applause. Thank you.